the Lord. Well, we're going to turn the service over to Brother Jonathan. Did I remember right that you uh, originally are out of Orchard Assembly? Is that right? I grew up in the Mobile area. Those are kind of my stomping grounds. That's right over in Mobile, next to the fairgrounds. But uh, got to meet Brother Jonathan. For those of you that didn't hear me talk about it this morning during Hurricane Sally, uh, I talked with uh, just a few out of the state office. They just like, can we help in any kind of way? We got men that want to come down and, and help, just help with the cleanup, help distribute, serve, whatever. I said, well, if you got people that want to come, I'm not going to turn help away. You can send whoever you want to send. And uh, Brother Jonathan and uh, I can't remember the other brother's name. Yeah. He was, uh, they, they came and showed up the day that uh, Midway uh, Assembly had brought that massive bus load of, of stuff and uh, they helped us form an assembly line and unload that and then after we got through we all took chainsaws over to Brother uh, Steve Cook's house and helped him cut limbs and trees off of his roof and uh, that inspired me and I thought if I was on the field and if my means of getting to my place in the field where God had called me was to make connections with pastors and allow them to help send me there, then I would have been doing what he was doing. Just, yeah, I want to go, I meet somebody new, they don't have to give me nothing, but I just want to go make connections with people. So uh, uh, that's, that's my kind of preacher, one that'll just, you don't need a pulpit, just make connections with people. So uh, anyway, it's an honor, for Jonathan, to have you and your wife tonight. Let's love him as he comes tonight. <laughs> Good evening, by the way. It's wonderful to be here with you. It wasn't entirely false advertising. It was just a recent, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we've been and where we're going. Uh, and it was just a recent thing that the Lord began to do. Now, I got to apologize. I did not tell them to make you look at my face the entire worship service. He, I think Brother Jason just liked that picture. He thought it was, a, at least you got my, my adorable kids up there. But that's me and my wife, my wife Brittany, she's here. If you'll just say hey real quick to everybody. And then, of course, you see Blake and Benjamin, our two little guys that are on this adventure with us. Uh, as it says, from, ba from Bengal to the Balkans. And really, it's from Bama to Bengal to the Balkans. And, and we, we come to this place where God had called, you know, just a normal, ordinary trailer park boy in Mobile, Alabama. My wife from Sims, Alabama. <clears throat> White picket fence, you know, that, that kind of like Southern Baptist girl, raised girl. And, and God called us, no, no one's special, and sent us to India. And now it's sending us to the Balkans. And, and uh, you know, if, if God can use us, then God can use anyone. That's what I would want to say. But that's where God is transferring us to, to the country of Montenegro. And you might be thinking, we'll get there in just a second. But first, we've been in India for the past five years. And we've gotten to be a part of some amazing things. We've gotten to be a part of uh, uh, starting a, as a small church playing team in Calcutta, or Kolkata as it's called, but Calcutta is its old name. Calcutta, India, among Muslim Bengalis, living, <clears throat> working, neighbors, friends, starting a, a small startup business uh, among, in, in a Muslim community uh, where we're having uh, handmade sewing items, blankets and scarves and just all bags, all sorts of things like that, being a part of that and seeing that uh, bring some, some incredible transformation, uh, material and economic transformation in that community to the lives of women, village women. Uh, just being a part of that, to, to seeing some of the first believers from a Muslim background come to faith in Jesus and form. A, and I have got a couple pictures. If you'll show the next picture, <clears throat> forming a, a small house church, a house church with our church playing team of Muslim background believers. I have an, another picture. I want to show you a couple of faces because take one thing to take away tonight. These are brothers and sisters. They come from a completely different background. They were born into a completely different religious tradition and worldview and place in the world. And, and <clears throat> they're not, they don't speak English. They're not, you know, it's, it's not that kind of relationship where you could just walk over to them and, and, and become their best friend because there's no English there. But, 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 but there are brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> 
And you see Bijoy and Sohan, Raj, Raja, Rahul. You see these brothers and some sisters as well. Take their faces away because as we were singing, this, this is the treasure. As Pastor shared earlier, this is the treasure. This is the treasure right here. The investment that we make with our lives and with our resources. This is the treasure of the kingdom of God. Yes. These are the treasured ones of God. It's been over the past year that God began to work on our hearts in prayers, praying towards the future. And, and it took a long time for us to, for the Lord finally to, 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 to get it through to us, really, me and my wife. That God was sending us, compelling us, sending us to a new place. Because we're like, oh, are you sure, God? Okay, maybe a little bit scuffle. Okay, God, maybe off in the future. Maybe years down the road. Oh, we'll get to it eventually. And God just had to keep working and working and working on us to be able to really to let go of some of the things we've been a part of the past five years in India. Bill say, okay, God, we sense you're calling us and we're, we're willing to go wherever. We're willing to do whatever, Lord. We'll follow you, Jesus, whatever that looks like. And, and once, once we had finally gotten settled, once we had finally figured it out, it was only a couple of weeks that it all happened pretty quickly that we talked to our leadership and we said, hey, we've been praying and fasting and the past year God has just not let it go and, and we prayed and explored and got a picture and this is what the Lord is, is leading us towards and it just took a couple of weeks in November for leadership to say, okay, if, if we're, we're on board, we, we're, we support you, we're with you, we're going to transfer you over and, and the Lord is leading us now to the country of Montenegro. And you might be saying, where in the world is Montenegro? Where, where is that exactly? Well, I brought a map to help out a little bit, help you find it. It's not, I told someone, they said, Mont, Montenegro, that sounds like Montego. Is that tropical Paris, Montego Bay or something like that? No, not, not exactly. I even circled it for you. <clears throat> so you see we're in southeastern Europe. You see the Balkans, the area that we're in, we're, uh, the neighbors like Serbia, Kosovo, Macedon Macedonia, Albania, Bosnia, Croatia. You see the part of the world that God is, is calling us into. Montenegro is just a small, mountainous country, about the size of Connecticut. Really small, densely mountainous. Only about 600-something thousand people living in this small, mountainous country. 600,000 people. My, I mean, my city in Kolkata, 16 million people lived in my city in Kolkata. I mean, like 600,000 people, that's like, that's like a few blocks in my old city, in my old neighborhood. And yes, we began to look and, and to see, to get a picture that we will be some of the first missionaries from our organization to this small mountainous country in the Balkans. We will be forming with some, with some other workers the first church planning team in this country to realize the need, the pioneer nature really grabbed onto our hearts and to, to hear going from a, a deeply religious Muslim culture in India is majority Hindu, but, but where we were among, we were among Muslims, that deeply religious, traditional Muslim culture that we were privileged to be a part of and learn language, learn Bengali language, and, and participate in the life of our friends and neighbors, to, to then transition to this new challenge of a post-Christian and secular context. You might say, what's, so, so really, what's, what's the big deal? Now, when I came for Hurricane Sally, around that time, as Pastor mentioned, I saw a few of y'all in your dressed down clothes, not your church clothes. I saw a few Alabama, a, few, few, a little bit of Alabama. So I think we got some Alabama fans. I brought a picture just to give you some perspective. Could you put that picture of Bryant Denny Stadium on? Now, this is going to be a shock. This is pre COVID. I mean, this is what we used to do back in the day, right here. <clears throat> 100,000 fans packing out Bryant Denny Stadium, cheering. You know, there's probably even a few a few Tennessee and Florida fans up in here because they want to know what it's like to win. They're probably snuck in. They don't belong, but they're there. Packed out. <clears throat> Packed out. Montenegro, the country of Montenegro, would fill Bryant Denny Stadium six times plus some. As I, we began to pray and, and, and see what the Lord was, was leading us towards in Montenegro, we found out that in Montenegro there are five churches spread across the country. They don't, they're, they're planted separately. They don't communicate. They don't, they're not networked together. There are five churches, 120 people, and half of them are children. And they're not even Montenegrans. They're, they're, Florida, they're Florida Tennessee fans. They're not even Montenegrans. They're, they're migrants from other countries that have come in, and, and they, they form their own little community, their own little church that they are part of. They're not even Montenegrans that make up this church. 
But to give you some perspective, Brian Denny Stadium right here, 100,000 Montenegrins packing it out, cheering for Alabama. 20 in this stands are believers. Half of those are children. 20. If you want to go to the next slide, somehow this small country has found itself to be home to a flock of flamingos. I don't know how it happened. I can't. All the sources are in Montenegro, and I can't read it, so I have no idea how in the world this came to be. But this beautiful birds, there are more flamingos right now that call Montenegro home than believers that call Montenegro home. That is the reality, the spiritual reality of this country that God is calling us towards. Now, the next question you might want to be asking is, well, Jonathan, how? What do you plan on doing? How do you plan on reaching people? How do you plan on <clears throat> church playing movement you're talking about? How does that even go about beginning? And to do that, and even maybe to share it in a way that challenges Bible Way Assembly right here in Foley, I want to share from Luke chapter 5, verse 17 and 26, a familiar passage, a familiar story that maybe you've heard from your childhood. But in looking over it, I hope that, that the Lord allows us to see our place in it, maybe in a way we didn't quite imagine. So in Luke chapter 5, verses 17, starting there. Yeah, if you'll stand. Oh, y'all do that here. Okay, nice. Starting in verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when, 19, and when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven. These are good words, but don't they stir up some trouble right here? And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Amen. And looking, you may be seated. And looking at this story, I want to ask you this question. Who is the hero in this story? Who is, who is the hero? Who is, is a, a central part of this story that if they were missing, none of it could happen? That's a good answer. And I'm not going to disagree with that because Jesus, he is the one who draws all people to God. In verse 17 and verse 19, even in this story, he is the one that draws crowds. He even draws people that can't stand him. They want to come anyway and hear what he has to say. He is the one who draws all men to God. He is the one who fully reveals the life and the reality of God to us through his embodiment of the word and his spirit-filled and spirit-permeated faithfulness to God. Verse 17, he was teaching them. He was revealing to them. He was giving to them truth and goodness from God that they could find nowhere else. Jesus is the one filled to overflowing with the life-giving Spirit of God in order to heal. It says the Spirit of God was upon him to heal them. And he was healing. And, and, and we're going to get to the friends in just a second. But people were coming and they were receiving healing and wholeness from Jesus. He is the one who can make whole, and he is the one with authority to forgive sins, to call people to forgiveness, to, to repentance, and faithfulness to God through himself. He says, follow me. If you follow me, you will find life. If you follow me, you will find the one that I call Abba. He is, he is the hero. 
no doubt. <clears throat> he is definitely the hero. Jesus is the hero for our dear friend Ronnie. If you'll show that first picture. <clears throat> going right there. <clears throat> our dear friend Ronnie. She's a young Muslim Bengali background young woman. Her, her, how she came to faith is a whole other story. That's, that's not where we're going tonight. But how she went from simply the hard, long road of a young Muslim woman to come to the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. How she went from just there to experiencing deep within her life and, and in the hardest circumstances of her life that Jesus is alive and present to her. So you see, her mother <clears throat> was sick. You can keep it on that picture for a while. Her mother was sick and had come down with a sudden illness in, in the city in Kolkata. And, and it was the middle of the night. She, she was alone. Her, her dad was out working. He was a, he's a rickshaw wallow, which means he, uh, he's one of those guys that stands with a bicycle with the seats in the back. You, know, you jump on. And you, he rides you to the train station or rides you around. He's a rickshaw wallow. That's what he does. And her brothers, she's uh, the oldest sibling. She has a younger sister and the two little brothers. So she's the oldest child at home. She comes in from working that day, and her mother just is, has a fever and just is, is laying on the bed. No dinner read, no dinner prepared, nothing. She's just, what is happening, mom? She, her mom's unresponsive. So she goes against her neighbor and says, hey, I need you to help me carry my mom. We have to get her to the hospital. And they, they get out, and they get to one hospital, and, and they're closed. They're not taking any new patients. So then they're like, go to this one. She goes to this other one, and same deal. She finally finds her way. We're talking 11 o'clock at night. Finds her way into a hospital, a third world, of course, hospital in Calcutta, India, gets her mom into a ward. She's sitting in there, terrified. The doctors are like, the, the nurses are saying the doctors will be in tomorrow. Then they'll see and figure out what's going on with your mom. Here, we'll put her on an IV. Here's a little bit of uh, pain medicine. You know, just give her some of that. We'll see her in the morning. It's in this ward, and, and uh, again, remember, third world hospital, <clears throat> ward, metal beds, seven, eight people in this thing with, with them. And it was terrifying to Ronnie. Because there are plenty of stories of people who go into these terrible, terrible hospitals and they don't come back. Because the, even the first night, the neighbor, the next, next uh, bed over, the woman had been left on an IV drip from the day. The next morning she was found and her IV drip had emptied and had filled back up and she was dead the next morning in her bed. Drained, drained her, the IV drip had drained her body. So Ronnie is terrified. Oh my goodness, I can't leave this hospital. Uh, they don't serve food. You have to get your own food. I mean, you have to pay for every little thing. Oh my goodness, I don't have any money. How am I going to get food for us? What am I going to do? I can't leave my mother right now. I don't know where my dad is. He, he's kind of absentee, sometimes drunk. He's not reliable. I don't know what I'm going to do. God help me. I can't leave my mother because if I come back, I don't know what state I'm going to find her in. She's terrified. 19, 20 year old young woman in this situation. And she says that she was terrified, felt weak, and, 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 and un, un, unprepared for this moment. And yet she began to pray and say, Jesus, help me, God. I've heard and I believe, I believe even just a little bit, Jesus, that you can bring my mom out of this hospital room. Jesus, you are here with me. I just, God, I don't know how, but I believe it. And she said that, that unlike ever she's experienced her life, that God was present in that little dingy hospital ward and God gave her the courage and the strength. She said she slept maybe a couple hours for three days. She don't know how it happened. She doesn't know. She said anytime the doctors came, <clears throat> And said, here's a mess and we need it. And she just said that, that, that someone called her and said, hey, we heard your mom. Here's some money. We're going to pay for that, for this thing. And she's just, God provided for her and God's presence was with her. And, and her mother came out of the hospital ward. And she, she even began to take care of other people in the hospital ward. She paid attention to what the nurses were doing, how the nurses fixed their IV when they came in. And what the, how they cared for patients. So when those nurses were gone for eight, ten hours, not showing back up, she then cared for everyone else in that room. They began to call her the, 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 uh, the little nurse. And, and, and God became so real to her that she knew that she knew that she knew that Jesus was alive. Jesus just wasn't someone on a page. Jesus was alive. Jesus was the hero that Ronnie needed. Jesus was present and empowering Ronnie for that terrible moment of her life. 
And since then, she has continued to walk in faithfulness, despite what that looks like, despite when the Milana, the local Milana, leader of the mosque comes by and says, we've heard that you believe these things in this house, and it's wrong. Your kafir, your, your, your uh, what's the right English word for that? Uh, infidel, or you're infidel, you're apostate. You're apostate, and you, you need to come back to the, to the truth of Islam because you're under judgment and, and in danger of hellfire. And for her to stand up, and even her mom, who, who continued to watch the witness in the life of her daughter, even her mom take her side and said, you know what? I've heard all the things that you have to say, and yet my daughter lives with the truth of Jesus, and it has transformed her life. And, and, and you can't, I, I, don't, I don't care what you say. I've seen the way that you live. I've seen the truth of God in her life and experienced the power of God in her prayers like I've never experienced in your prayers. Jesus is more wonderful than words can express. My sister Ronnie, she, she knows this. And I think, yet I think there's another that we must also consider here in this story. We can look at the four friends. I mean, these four friends are, these are incredible friends. I want these, I want to be a friend like this. I want friends like this in my life. You see, they're attentive and they're concerned about the needs of their dear friend. How often is it that <clears throat> when someone's a burden on us or the relationship's a little bit too taxing and it's just a little bit inconveniencing, we're like, oh, man, oh, uh, ignore that phone call. Uh, oh, hi, have that text. Don't, don't open that text. I, I never saw it. I never saw it. Unread. And yet these friends were friends that as hard and difficult as this man's life was for him and on his friends and his family, they were still concerned and they still cared for him. They were still attentive and present to him. These friends also recognized that the potential source of life transformation that he needed had just walked into town. He had friends. I didn't, on the screen before, some, some of those guys, <clears throat> some of them hadn't even come to faith, but their oldest brother was having some mental health issues. We prayed with him. We begged and pleaded for the family to just let us take him to a good doctor in the city. They all, this is all outside of the city in a small village outside the city of Kolkata. Uh, we live on the edge, and they're just right outside the city. Begged and pleaded, let, just please, please let's take him to a good doctor. Immediately, they want to take him to basically a white magic Muslim shaman. Who would then, they would pay, oh, good money out. They would empty their pockets for him. And he would keep adding, keep adding, oh, I've got to do this, and I've got to do this. And they would just keep putting the money out for him. And he would <clears throat> pray prayers and say incantations and slap emblems and objects onto him to bind onto him to wear in order to say that you know, he has a bad spirit in him. We, to, we need to invoke the power of a good spirit to come and deal with this. We finally did get him to a good doctor. We finally did say, okay, you don't need, this is not helpful. Just take that off. This is just a waste of money. It's not helpful. This is going to help you. But this guy had friends that knew the source of healing and transformation he needed. He had some good friends. These friends stopped at nothing to make their friend well, and they succeeded in getting him to Jesus. I think of how our church, how our team in Kolkata has been a friend to so many people. The man, the Soruk Mondal, who I just mentioned, and also a, a man named Eunice. If you'll show a picture, put that picture up there. The the one, um, two older guys, the two older guys hanging out. If you'll put that picture up there, uh, Eunice. Eunice means Jonah in Muslimani Bengali. There we go. One on the left is Eunice. Eunice, his family home was across the street from our little sewing shop in the village that we, uh, that we managed and that we ran. So on the way in and out, we constantly would see, stop by and visit him. Uh, he would invite us into his home. He would invite us for tea, for meals, or in holidays, or in special days, anything. He would just invite us over, and we had plenty of time as a team to, to, to get to know him. And the good thing is that, of course, he would hear about our faith from other people, and he would ask questions, and we would share things. You know, we would just share things. 
<clears throat> about our faith in Jesus, about why and what this means. And hey, he kept inviting us. That's a good sign. He kept inviting us over for, for tea and for meals. So we kept on coming up. We kept on coming and showing up for him. One day, Eunice pulls his shirt up and tells me that he has hadn't been sleeping well. And he has this knot, like a stone, just sitting in his abdomen. I touched on it. You could feel, you could feel the, the soft flesh around his stomach. And then you, despite you would feel that like a, like a stone was just sitting in solid. And he says, I just went to the doctor. He said, I've been hurting and it's just, it's been, it's been had all sorts of pain. I went to the doctor and, and a Hindu, a huge Hindu holiday is coming up, a month long holiday for the year is coming up. So the doctor said, here's some medicine, come back, here's some scans, come back in a month. We'll do some more scans and we'll schedule a surgery to deal with this. So for the first time I said, brother, I said, uncle, so Kaku, uncle, I said, you've heard about Jesus and we believe that Jesus has power to heal and to make well. Can I pray for you? And he thought about it for a second and I guess he, he was just open to whatever, whatever would help him. He says, oh yeah, please, please pray for me. I said, well, no, I want to do right now. He's like, oh, right now? Like, oh, okay, like. I guess it's pretty common for Muslims as well to say, hey, I'm going to pray for you and then walk off. And of course, you know, never pray and stay or prayer or whatever. I say a prayer for him right there and prayed fervently in the name of Jesus that, that whatever is happening in his abdomen, that the doctors aren't, that they're delaying treatment for, that, that Jesus would bring healing to his body. Amen. Our team continued that next month. Whenever we stopped by, we would continue to stop and just pray with him. Pray for his healing. Sure enough, the Hindu holiday is over with. The big Durga Puja is over with. He goes to the doctor. They run some scans. <clears throat> and they say, well, we don't have to schedule a surgery. Well, I mean, I, we don't understand. We're looking at the scans we took last month. We're looking at the scans we took this month. And whatever that mass was that was in your abdomen, it's not showing up on your scan. So we, we can't do a surgery because it's not there anymore. And then when I came back to the village and I said, how is Brother Eunice? How's my uncle Eunice? And they said, he's excited because, because he, he, God's healed him. God has healed him. And he knows that the difference was that Jesus had been called upon to do wonders in his body. The friends of this lame man, they were attentive. They were present. You know, imagine, I mean, it would be really easy. It would be really easy for our family to not make those kinds of transitions and say, you know what, God, you have called us. God, help us to love Muslim neighbors in India that we don't know yet. With your love, help us to love post-Christian and secular people in Montenegro with your love that we don't even know yet. It would be easier just to stay put. It would be easier to stay in your family. It would be easier not to go through all of that. But the thing is, the world needs friends like these four friends in this story. They need friends who know the source of life and salvation and healing. They, know, they need friends who will stop at nothing to bring them before Jesus for the transformation they need. These, these friends truly loved their neighbors, their neighbor as their self on that day. And they did their part to cooperate and partner with God for this transformational and revelatory moment. They aren't named, but they are heroes. But yet there's still another con to consider. And you're thinking, wait, okay, we've Jesus, the four friends. Well, it isn't the lame man. He kind of just, he just lays there. Like, he doesn't really do much in the story. He gets healed. That's pretty awesome, but... It sure in the disciples and the apostles, they're not even mentioned in here. And man, most of the time, these knuckleheads, whew, they, they, they just, I, I like these guys because they stick around. I mean, they, they don't understand what's happening. They don't get it. They get it wrong half the time. But Jesus says, hey, drink my blood and eat my flesh. And, and everyone leaves them. And he says, hey, you're all leaving too. He said, no, where, where else are we going to go? We're with you to the end. You have the words of life. They stick around. But they're not, they're not the heroes of this story. And it sure isn't the Pharisees and the experts in the law of Moses and Jewish traditions that are the heroes. Then, then who is it? In this story in Luke chapter 5, I think someone to consider it who is unnamed and 
unmentioned but integral to this whole occasion of God's goodness to heal and forgive in Jesus for it all to happen. And that is the host, the man who owns this house, the people who own this house, the, one who, the people who facilitate this entire thing to happen in the first place. You see, the host had to make space for Jesus in his home. He had to make space for Jesus in his life. And in making that space, he knew that Jesus wouldn't keep this just a private affair. I don't think he, he invited Jesus into his home thinking this was just going to be a quiet little sit-down dinner between him and his family. He knew that Jesus would never remain low-key and private. But Jesus calls to others, and he invites others, and that Jesus would bring people into this person's home and life that he never could have expected. And yet he still said yes to Jesus. He still opened his home and his life to Jesus and to the relationships and to the people that Jesus would draw and bring into his life and into his home. Is your living encounter with the Christ is it a quiet, private affair? I'm not talking about in here, because we can do, we have good church. We can get loud and get excited in here together. But outside the doors, is it a quiet, private affair? Is it merely something that you intended to get some, some good personal benefits out of and then go about your day as normal? Does your encounter with the living Christ lead you into the lives of others, of people who are, who are lost, people who are so far uh, from, the, from the Lord, so deep in their sin, deep in their woundedness, deep in their pain? Does, does your encounter with Jesus bring you to those people? Because that is where Jesus is. Can we make space for Jesus and for all those that he wants to bring into our lives? Or maybe those he already has. You see, you got to be okay with just a little bit of mess. When we would host Jamaat, our house church that you had just seen, we would host this house church in our, in our home. <clears throat> we had a 1,000, like a 1,100 square foot apartment, 1,000 square foot apartment in India. And we would host Jamaat, which, which, which had gotten from five years ago just one guy who had come to faith and was baptized and his brother who was started to come along with him to two dozen, over two dozen young Muslim background believers uh, in their late teens and early 20s, mid-20s, we, we pack in 30 people into this little 1,100-square-foot apartment. And, man, when they left, I mean, Indians, oh, if you're ever hosted by Indians, it'll be, they, you will be treated like royalty. But it's also true the opposite. When they come to be hosted, they expect royalty treatment. And so we would have all of our dear brothers and sisters and seekers and people who are just getting, had to muster up the courage to even come be a part of something like this in our home. And, and, and when they left, the place was a mess. It was a disaster. It was, but it would be late at night, usually on a Friday evening. So just turn the lights off. No, we're feeding a few cockroaches, I guess. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll get back. We'll clean it tomorrow morning after we've had about a few hours of sleep to recover. People popping in and popping out in the day. Going and being a part, showing up and being a part of people in their life where they're at. Intentionally where they're at. Intentionally seeking out a meal. Seeking out a chance to spend time with people who need a Christ-like influence. You got to be okay with a little mess. I mean, I, I know my wife still... <clears throat> And maybe you can relate. You got people, if you know someone's coming over, you got to put in the calendar and you got to spend a whole day before cleaning. And then you got to go grocery shopping and you got to stock the fridge because you got to have a, a, some good food. I mean, the thing is, you don't, we really don't need all of that. Because what the most important thing that we can bring to this is ourselves, our experience of Christ, and of course, Jesus, who takes center stage in our lives. We got to be okay with a little mess. We can't always have a perfect home and be the perfect host like Joanna Gaines on HGTV. You got to be intentional with your time and your relationships. It, you, you notice the story didn't happen in a synagogue. It didn't happen in the temple. It didn't happen in one of those kinds. It happened in a, someone's home. 
in the midst of where life is lived and experienced. It required having under his roof people who disagreed on a lot of different issues. He had, Phar he had Pharisees. People were plotting to kill Jesus along with Jesus, his disciples, even looking at Jesus' disciples, all the different conflicts and, and, and different backgrounds that were there, and then imagine who else came to see the whole ordeal. I mean, he was willing to have a whole bunch of different people that didn't always see eye to eye. They weren't all the same. They didn't sound the same. They didn't dress the same. They didn't look the same. They didn't think the same way. And he was willing to have them because that's who Jesus brings to his table. Jesus doesn't limit himself to people of certain beliefs or backgrounds or to certain families. He doesn't limit himself to languages or ethnicity or political affiliation or even opinions about God and his own identity. He says, come and experience, hear my words, experience the life that I have to offer. My brother Sohan, if you'll Go to the young man that's a picture of a young man, Sohan. First met him about five, oh, it's not coming up. First met him about five years ago now, five, six years ago now. Young guy, 15, 16 years old, 14 years old, somewhere in that range. Oh, we're up, here we go, Sohan. Young Muslim background man. I'll never forget the first day when he, the, the day that he confessed to me that no one, that everyone in his life leaves him. He loved his grandfather dearly. His grandfather died suddenly, unexpectedly. His, his mother he loved dearly, and his mother left, divorced his father, and left and went back to Bangladesh next door. Hadn't seen his mother in over a decade. And it was coming up soon, one of the times, the first time we were leaving India to come back to the States, and he said, Everyone in my life I love leaves me. Why are you leaving me now? He wasn't a believer at this point, but I simply said, brother, I'm going away for just a little while, but I promise I'll be back. But there is one Jesus who will never leave you. He loves you more than I love you. He'll love you more than your grandfather and your mother did. He, he, he will love you and he will never abandon you or forsake you. Jesus will be present to you. He was raised, as I said, in a, in, a, in a Muslim home, but it was a broken home. Like I said, his mother's divorced. His father is a drunk. And to compensate for all of this, he applied himself to religion, to religious studies. He studied in Madrasa, which is the religious school where he would learn Quran. And, and this young man can quote, at one point could quote, whole passages of Quran in perfect Arabic. He doesn't speak Arabic. He doesn't really understand Arabic, but he could quote whole passages of Quran in Arabic applying himself to be religious, applying himself to earn the, the respect and the honor of his community, to, to earn the favor and the love of Allah. <clears throat> then he begins to hang out with me and, and becomes like a young brother, becomes a, a part of our family. <clears throat> he was with us when we prayed for Eunice. He was the first one that comes back when I come back to the village. I say, how is uncle? He's, he had his, his, his appointment today. When is his surgery? And he's the one that comes back and says, brother, Kaku, Eunice, Eunice is healed. Jesus has healed him. He is, he is no longer sick. Sohan was the one that came proclaiming the goodness of God. It was with Sohan and a few other young guys right before we left several years ago. I got a pitcher of water, and I read in the scriptures about the Last Supper with Jesus, and I began to wash their feet. And I went down the line, and there was a lot of tears, and, and there was, they argued, and, no, brother, no, you cannot do this to us, big brother. You cannot do this for us. We, and they just said, no, no, I, I, I'm going to do this because I love you. Jesus says to do this. I love you, and I'm going to do this. And I get to Sohan last in line. And I wash his feet. He's crying. And then he says, okay, now you have to sit down. So he takes the bowl and he begins to wash my feet. 
And, and I said, no, brother, no, no, that's not what this night is about. That's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm not trying to make you serve me. That's not what the kind of work we're doing. That's not who we are. And he said, no, brother. He says, you have washed my feet. He said, you love me. Jesus has commanded you to wash my feet. Jesus has commanded me to wash your feet. So now I must wash your feet as well. <clears throat> my brother Sohan, shortly after that, he began to confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And I promise you <clears throat> that if our team had not facilitated and opened our lives up to Sohan and, and presented him with a life and, and, and a knowledge of God and the experience of Jesus and the truth of Jesus that was, that was new and life-giving and hope-giving, that was different from what he had learned in Madrasa and what he heard in the mosque every Friday afternoon at prayer and what he experienced in his broken family and the loss and the experience that he experienced all through his short life. Up to that point, Jesus could not have been fully revealed to my brother. Jesus would never have heard the words that he says here. Your sins are forgiven. Rise up and walk. The host of this whole event is unnamed, uncelebrated, but he is the, the person who opened his life to Jesus and he opened his life to others, allowing for some of that mess. Imagine sitting there and you're watching over the party. Uh, maybe it was a good Pentecostal. He was in a back room praying. I don't know. Like, but imagine seeing some dust fall and go, what, what is happening up there? Dude, people, people got up on the roof. Like, can you imagine? Like, people who climbed up on my roof. What are they doing up there? Sending somebody up there. Hey, go check on it. Maybe he went and checked on it himself. He gets up there and he sees four guys digging through his roof. And he's, Guys, are you crazy? What is wrong with you? What are you doing? I said, look, sir, I'm sorry. We'll figure it out later, but you just don't understand. So many people have come to see Jesus, and I'm sure that they have important needs, but our friend, we have to get him to Jesus. He can't do it himself. We are going to get him to Jesus. We have to tear your roof apart. I'm sorry. And he says, in that case, you know what? I've already committed this far. Go for it. Open my roof up. Tear it up. If that's what it takes to get your friend before Jesus, be my guest. Willing for the mess. Willing for the inconveniences. The serious inconveniences. So that Jesus could be present and center stage for others. That is who we have been in India. That is who we've been stateside. And that's who we will be in Montenegro. God is sending us out to a pioneer field, and Jesus is calling you, brothers and sisters, out to the world among people whom he loves and is reconciled to himself in Christ Jesus. He's calling you to make space at your table for difference, to be okay for your house or your car to get a little messy and to not be perfect all the time in order to be with people who need Jesus' love and truth in their life. He's sending you out to live intentionally towards neighbors and, and enemies, towards friends and family members. And sometimes they can fall in those categories, can't they? Enemy and, and neighbor and enemy. And co-workers as well. To hear them and to know them and to discover what Christ is doing in their lives. God is sending us out to a new field and there's going to be plenty of challenges and adjustments. But we say yes to new language we say yes to new culture. We say yes to, to all those experiences all over again so that Jesus can be known among Montenegrins, so that there can be a disciple-making movement, a church-planning movement that gives life to the country of Montenegro and to the Balkans. If you will, just stand with me just for a moment. You've been sitting for just a little while. I think we, we have just a few moments left. Just want to... Take this a few moments to lead in prayer, in intercession prayer. We can make this whole place an altar just for a few moments and just to pray for those brothers and sisters in India that we've had to say goodbye to for now. To pray for the work that God desires to do, the hard, rocky soil in Montenegro that God desires us just to begin to pull the rocks out of, 
that one day there can be a harvest and for what God desires to do in Foley, Alabama. Amen. Let's begin to pray, church. Father, we thank you for your goodness, oh God. We thank you that you, God, have not given up upon the, Ish, the descendants of Ishmael, that your love for Muslims is great, that your heart towards them is kind. You desire their life and their repentance, and, and their, their, you desire their well-being and their newness of life in Christ. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters that are in India and all across the world, that you would in, empower them by your spirit and your love. Give them the courage to live faithful lives in their communities, to live faithful lives among their families and friends. God, that their lives would be a beautiful witness and a testimony to the surrounding, to their neighbors in their community, oh Lord. Would you place your spirit of power upon our friends in India and all around the world? Our, our, our dearly beloved friends and sisters and brothers and sisters who come from Muslim background, Lord, would you fill them with your spirit of power? Lord, we pray looking forward to what you have to do in Southeast Europe, in the country of Montenegro, oh God. Lord, there is a history there. There's a history of cultural Christianity. There's a history of empire. There's a history of religion. But God, you're not interested in, in a merely a history. God, you desire to be the living Christ alive in the midst of Montenegro today. That men and women would experience themselves the faith and the life of Jesus to follow you, to form a church that is centered around your name, that you take center place in, that you would be the, the, the hero of, that you would be the one that draws men in Montenegro, men and women, young and old, draw them to God, oh Jesus, draw them to your cross. Lord, whatever it looks like for us, we will go. We say yes, oh Lord. And Lord, for our friends here at Bible Way Assembly, Lord, we pray that you would stretch and grow and challenge this church to grow deeper in their faith and their faithfulness to you, that you would turn them towards their neighbors and their co-workers and their family and friends and even their enemies. God, you would turn them towards them with, with the, the spirit of mercy and love and grace and compassion that we just sang about. Our Lord, who is, is a God of mercy and grace and of the cross. That you would help us to see with new eyes people who are so challenging, they're so difficult at times, but to see them with your eyes, to see them with your love, to see them the way that you see them, oh God. Give us a heart for the lost. Give us a heart for the hurting. Give us a heart God, for our neighbors and for those around us, O oh Lord. As you will bless this church as they seek to make you, Jesus, the center of this church, the center of this community, the center of their relationships and their lives. And they invite they relate to people whom you are calling and drawing to new life. Lord, I want to hear testimonies in a few years when I, Lord willing, we're able to come back in a few years and, and I want to hear testimonies, more testimonies like Brother Cuck, more testimonies of how you have transformed his life in this community of Christ. More testimonies like my brother, how you have transformed him through the faithfulness and the goodness and presence in this house and the, among these people, your church, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us men as well, let's come gather around this altar tonight and uh, I want us to pray for the Hollingsworth family I want us to pray God's hand upon their life upon those boys born into a, a missions family who are called with their parents to give their 
whole life, everything about their life pertains to the call of God. That is a that is a level of sacrifice that few people ever think about when you talk about missions. Their children are just called to sacrifice and go. Uh, we support missionaries where the parents are on the field and the children are over here going through college and they're separated by thousands of miles. And the level of sacrifice. I, I want you to pray for them. Who knows the, I guess, the degree of hardness of heart, or I don't, I don't know the right words to say, apathy or whatever towards the gospel that they'll encounter in Montenegro. I've never been there. But I want us to pray that God will anoint them to pierce the darkness, to penetrate the heart of those people, that the love of Christ, the love of God in Christ Jesus would win that country over. Amen. That God use them mightily. That I want you to pray for us. What we're face, facing in our nation. That God would anoint us and use us to facilitate a move of God here in America. I believe nothing short of revival is going to heal our land. And we are the house, the house of God. We're the place where this resurrection called revival needs to take place for our nation. We're the place where this healing should happen right here in God's own house. Would you pray both for their land and for ours tonight? Father, I thank you for this word from heaven tonight. God, I thank you that you are most certainly the hero in the story, without which there would have been no story. Oh, God, you're the healer. You're the giver of every good and every perfect gift. I thank you, Lord, for the four friends in this story. God, who sacrificed, who bore the burden of bringing their friends to the feet of Jesus and I thank you for the host I've been right to that house I've stood right there and looked down from the roof they've got covered in glass right now I imagine with my mind what it must have been like when they lowered that man sick of the palsy down at the feet of Jesus the floor of that house is not near as big as this sanctuary, Lord. But you worked a miracle in that, in that house today. I pray you'll work one in this one. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, we need you as desperately as that man who was lying on his bed. We need you to raise us up. As a nation, oh God, we need you to raise up young men and young women full of the Holy Ghost. We need you to raise up preachers and pastors, evangelists and missionaries full of the Holy Ghost. To raise up moms and dads, oh God, that would dare train up their children in the way that they should go that when they're old they won't depart from it. God, that we might in our generation reach our nation as our forefathers did in theirs. Lest there be no Pentecostal church for our grandchildren to be a part of. Oh, I refuse. I refuse to watch it die. I refuse to watch my nation die. I refuse to let my neighbor die. Lest there be no church. Oh, God. Help me to be one that both bears the burden and one who's willing to host and facilitate a move of God. I thank you for this precious gospel that still speaks to our hearts. 
these things are written for our example. God, I pray. I pray that you'll use us. Use us, oh God, to intercede. Hear our prayer. Hear our hearts cry. We thank you, Lord for the unspeakable gift of Jesus Christ. Because you live, we live also. Because you've given, we give. I want to thank you. Thank you for this family, the Hollingsworth family. Thank you for my church family, Lord, who prove it time and time again, God, that they love you through their giving. And God, I praise you. I praise you for it tonight. I pray you'll bless them for their gift they gave tonight. And they'll reap it again and again and again in your untold blessing. God, those that we prayed for this morning, let healing virtue take hold of their body. Brother and Sister Carly, Brother Tim, and the Fort Select Church family. I pray for Brother Corey Green, Lord, who's an ICU, 35 years old, with COVID tonight. I ask you to touch and heal his body. Raise him up, Lord. What you've done, God, for this man, the testimony we heard tonight, you're that kind of Savior. You're that kind of Lord and God. You're a healer. Touch and make whole tonight is our prayer. We ask you tonight in the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus. You give the Lord a hankering. Touch my mind, Lord. You have many times before. Touch her again tonight. Heal that irregular heartbeat. Hey, feel. God, put that heart back in the rhythm. Let it beat properly. I pray whatever causes it, Lord, you'd go right to the root of it. You'd heal her so that she wouldn't have to deal with the effects of it anymore. We love you, Lord. We trust you. With your stripes, we're healed. By your power, we're made whole. God, through the promise and the authority of your word, we stand in faith believing. What we've asked, you're able to do it. Is there anything too hard for you? We already know the answer is no, Lord. I praise you for healing my mom, for touching us here at the salt of the night. I want to thank you. There was uh, $760 come in. Tonight, we had 500 come in and a check this week. That made it 1,400 and something, so we just made it 1,500 tonight. So, uh, praise God for you, brother. We rejoice with you that uh, you're ready to go. Amen. Let's give the Lord another hand clap. church. I appreciate your heart for God to give. Make sure you love his family before they leave tonight. Let them know we appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you, brother.